For those who may have missed last week and are joining us, or for those for whom this alphabet soup of Bible criticism is getting to be a little bit uh, dense, uh, let me start with just a moment of review. We are understanding the Hebrew Bible as a product that came into our possession over time and that reflects the lived experience of the people Israel in their political and their social and their economic and of course also their religious lives. We saw that the time span for this process is quite a few centuries. We dated the exodus from Egypt uh, at uh, some time in the 1200s before the Christian era begins. Uh, we, we settled on that date because of the likelihood that the Pharaoh of the Exodus was Pharaoh Ramesses II. And if you like your Bible movies, it's Yul Brynner and not Frank Langella. Because <laughs> both very fine actors, right? because the uh, Frank Langella uh, movie has Pharaoh Merneftha, which is the son of Ramesses II. That is the other scholarly theory. Uh, I'm gonna bet my Dumar's milkshake on Ramesses II. <laughs> because, as it says in Exodus 1, the Israelites were compelled to do forced labor building garrison cities. One named Pithom, the other one named Ramses. And in, in the thinking of a majority of scholars, the father of Ramesses II, King Pharaoh Seti, moves the capital of Egypt further north to the Nile Delta because he's worried about invasion from Mesopotamia, people coming down, following the, the coastal highway, <laughs> of um, the Mediterranean and breaking into Egypt through what is modern day El Arish. And so he wants to garrison that northeastern frontier of Egypt. And he uses slaves to do so. He assigns his crown prince, Ramesses, to oversee it. Ramesses did not suffer from excessive humility. <laughs> we know that from his many, many statues. So sure enough, he names the city after himself, Ramesses. Moreover, we know from archeology span that Ramesses' own firstborn did not succeed him. This firstborn prince named Amun Her Hefesh F, uh, I call him F for short, uh, uh, died in the 25th year of Ramesses' 60 plus year reign. He was like the Queen Victoria of Egypt. <laughs> And his body was brought back to Egypt for a state funeral, probably died in battle. But I'm thinking that that's the nucleus of the saga of the 10 plagues that we have, culminating in the plague of the firstborn. If you look at the Psalms, if you look at uh, the burning bush story, Exodus chapters three and four, you can see that whatever the other plagues may or may not have been, and the different uh, parts of the Hebrew Bible don't all enumerate them all, but they all get the plague of the firstborn. That seems to be what really was focused uh, in, in their minds. So anyway, we think of the Exodus as about the mid 1200s when Ramesses II was the Pharaoh. By 50 years later, his son Merneftha had a victory stele, which was discovered in the 1890s which says that he had a punitive military expedition into the land of Canaan where he defeated the Israelites. Meaning that Israelites are already living in what we call the land of Israel by the reign of the successor of Pharaoh Merneftha. We call that the period of the judges or which really means the clan chieftains because it was not one unified country, it was many different tribes. And we took a look at one of the oldest documents in the Hebrew Bible, the Song of Deborah, Book of Judges, chapter five, to show that her understanding of the, the, the people Israel was the tribes, not one nation. When does it become one nation? Well, the people clamored for a king. Uh, they got an unsuccessful first king, King Saul, 
I, I have some sympathy for Saul because uh, it was clear that the PR machine was not for him. <laughs> uh, perhaps it was the priests of the Shiloh, or we call it Shiloh Sanctuary. I'm going to come back to the Shiloh night priests uh, in the course of today. Uh, they may have felt that uh, this, this new authority is cutting into their authority. Perhaps. Saul doesn't make it, but his successor, David, he's, you know, he, he's the, uh, the fair-haired boy. <laughs> Even when he does wrong, it's like he can do no wrong, because his, his heart is with God, whatever that means. <laughs> Just remember, if that part of the book of Samuel had been written by people working for Saul, it would have come out very different. <laughs> than if it had written by people who are working for, for King David. Uh, there's a, a pretty bad movie, but with some good points, called uh, King David, starring Richard Gere. You ever see that film? At the very end of it, David is on his deathbed, and he's trying to give Solomon some uh, unorthodox advice. <laughs> he tells Solomon, don't listen to what all these prophets tell you. <laughs> listen to your heart. Who, who sings that nowadays, listen to your heart? That's not Taylor Swift, is it? Who sings? Listen to your heart. Anyone know? Taylor Swift? Okay, so before there was Taylor Swift, there was King David. <laughs> anyway, so this scribe in the corner of the room is busy writing that down. And David says with some irritation, must you write everything I say? <laughs> and the scribe says, it's your majesty's orders. It's for the book of Samuel. <laughs> Which is actually a biblical memory. Second Samuel chapter 22 has a, a, a listing of who the, the officials were in his inner, inner court. And there was a recorder there. There was an archivist. Maybe that's the author. Who knows? Maybe that's where, you know, he, it, it's like um, Hirschfeld used to put his, uh, his daughter's name into every one of his, his uh, illustrations. You ever see that? Is it Nina he puts it in? So if you look hard enough, you find the Nina in the book of Samuel for the guy who actually wrote it. Perhaps. The courts of David and Solomon focused on the tribe of Judah, and we saw that the literary renaissance that uh, they presided over gave us the first major document that is assembled over time into the Hebrew Testament. We called that the document J. We called it J. We could have called it Y, but the letter J was used for the sound Y in German. And the name of God that we mispronounce as Jehovah would actually be written with only consonants Y-H-W-H. -H. So the J of Jehovah is uh, what gives that J source its uh, scholarly uh, alphabet soup moniker. Because according to that source, people were calling by God, calling God by that name, starting with the generation of Enosh, the grandson of Adam and Eve. And so in the book of Genesis, any time God is referred to by that name, we think of that as, well, not any time, but when God is referred to exclusively by that name, we, we think of that as the J source. The J source reflects the interests of the tribe of Judah, the interests of King David, and the interests of King Solomon, and therefore the building of the Solomonic Temple is the high point of the whole saga of God's uh, redemptive history with the people of Israel. Uh, Germans have wonderful long names for all of this, and they call this Heilsgeschichte, right? The history of God's saving deeds. So for the, for the document that we call J, it starts at the very beginning, and its climax is when Solomon builds the temple, and uh, God you know, blesses that endeavor. But there were other voices, indeed, other voices. I mentioned last time, imagine a history of colonial America written in Massachusetts, not written in Virginia. It might have had a different take on what happened in those 13 colonies, right? Or as you well know, um, as you well know, a, uh, a book that talks about the Civil War and refers to the Battle of Sharpsburg is likely to reflect a Southern perspective. Whereas a northern author would refer to the same battle as the Battle of Antietam, 
Antietam Creek, right? Pittsburgh Landing versus Shiloh, and so on and so forth. So there are little thumbprints of where these documents come from. And alongside of the J document, we saw last time another document that we call the E document. Again, it's not because Bible scholars have a greater fondness for alphabet soup than the rest of us, um, but because E is the first letter of the Hebrew word Elohim. Actually, that's not true. Aleph is the first letter of Elohim, but transliterated into E. So according to the E document, Exodus chapter six, verses two and three, God revealed that special name, Jehovah, only to Moses. And the earlier uh, great re religious worthies of the Israelite tradition, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, knew God under one of the names that starts with El, E-L. Elohim, El Shaddai, El Elyon, the various combinations of the word El, which basically means God. And God says to Moses, this personal name of mine is a power name. Using this name, you will be able to do what seems impossible to you right now. And that's the point of the, uh, the story in Exodus chapter six. So we spent some time looking at this E document. It seems to reflect the interests of the central and northern tribes, not the tribe of Judah. So let me direct you to today's map. You see where it says Israel in large print and then Samaria up and to the left of that? that that's the, the center of the land of Israel. And it goes all the way north to where it says Dan or Dan, right? That's the northern terminus. And the border between Israel and Judah was a little bit north of Jerusalem. But from Jerusalem and to the south is the kingdom of Judah. So the E document seems to uh, reflect the interests of that, the tribes that live there. Now, one of the main tribes was the son of Joseph, Ephraim, E for Ephraim. So if uh, Jehovah and Elohim don't stick in your mind, you can just remember Judah and Ephraim being the J and the E source. Now, what I didn't say last week, but what I'd like to say this week, uh, take a look please under the eye of Israel. The first city is Shiloh. See that? In Hebrew, Shiloh. If you, um, if you look at the opening narrative, you don't have to turn to it now, but if you look at the opening narrative in the book of Samuel about the birth of Samuel, you'll see that um, Elkanah and his wives, Penina and Hannah, would go to Shiloh every year to make their pilgrimage and offer worship to the Lord. And that the high priest Eli, in English Eli, was, uh, was officiating there. Uh, you, it's a very beautiful story. Hannah wants a child, she's very upset. She starts praying quietly, only her lips are moving. Eli thinks she's drunk. He, mis he misconstrues it completely. And he says, drunks are not allowed here. And she says, oh sir, I'm not drunk, I'm depressed. <laughs> And, and he, he's humble. I mean, he, he takes the correction and he says, well, let me add my prayer to yours. And um, she's, she's relieved. And uh, she didn't have to go to the Jones Clinic. She, she <laughs> conceived. <laughs> By the way, I know pastorally of couples who finally gave up trying to conceive and they, and they started investigating uh, adoption. And then she conceives because the pressure is off. I'm guessing it's because the pressure is off, right? So uh, it could happen. You know, maybe you know, the, the priest saying, I join my prayer to yours, maybe it allowed her some physiological response. Whatever it is, we're grateful for it. So that story features uh, Shiloh, Shiloh as the central sanctuary. Well, what happens to Shiloh as a sanctuary uh, when Solomon builds the temple in Jerusalem? Well, what happens to the economy of Williamsburg when the capital moves to Richmond? What happened to the port of um, Newport, Rhode Island, when the capital moved to Providence? You understand these, these things happen. Chamber of Commerce of Williamsburg might not have been happy about that. 
Bruton Parish Church might not have been happy about that, <laughs> since we want to keep it close to home here, right? If, uh, if, if the people who count are moving to Richmond, what's going to happen to those nice pew rentals that you get every year in Bruton Parish Church? <laughs> let's say, you know, let, let, let's talk shekels here. <laughs> So one would be entitled to think that the, the shrine at Shiloh uh, contained people who were not so happy about the Jerusalem temple. Well, were they happy about Jeroboam, who was the Jefferson Davis of the Hebrew Bible, the one who secedes? Well, not really. Take a look at the map again. You'll see on the very north, Dan. Jeroboam sets up calf idols at Dan in the north and take a look at Bethel. I know, it's, uh, he, down here it's pronounced Bethel, but in Hebrew it's Bethel, uh, just um, one, two, three dots north of Jerusalem. See that? So those are the northern and southern termini of the northern kingdom, and Jeroboam sets up not one, but two golden calf statues to divert the pilgrimage traffic from Jerusalem to there. Take a wild guess. J or E is the document that gives us the harsh criticism of the golden calf in Exodus. Would that be a J or an E document? It's an E document because the E authors were not happy about Jeroboam setting up two golden calves and further shunting all the religious sentiment away from what they thought was the true worship of the one God and diverting it to something that looked terribly idolatrous to them. A golden bull calf. Didn't God just say, make no images, right? Have no images in your worship? And he creates a golden bull calf right away. Right. So <clears throat> the, it seems to us that the priests of Shiloh were happy neither with the kingdom of Judah nor with the uh, kingdom of Israel. But they were still there and they were doing their, their level best. Now, historically, the kingdom of Israel was destroyed by one of the empires that rose to great military power, the Assyrian Empire. Its base of strength was modern day Iraq and Syria. First, they defeated the other Arameans, the people of Syria, and they they had a policy of forcibly exiling the populations that they conquered, which by the way is why Aramaic became the common language of the ancient Near East. Because all of these Aramaic speakers were exiled to all of the reaches of the Assyrian Empire. And you may well know that even the later books of the Hebrew Bible, the book of Daniel, book of Ezra, etc., uh, have uh, portions written in Aramaic. And what you may or may not know is that even some of the later books of the Bible written in Hebrew have Aramaic borrowings in the way that certain phrases are cast. So it's, it's clear that Aramaic is the, the language that people spoke. And in the New Testament too, you'll see that the Aramaic is uh, one of the uh, languages that people just absolutely spoke. So, the Assyrians, first they conquer the Syrians, the Arameans, and then they keep going and they conquer the northern kingdom of Israel. They disperse the uh, tribes of Israel. They're what we call the 10 lost tribes. It's, it's a whole other uh, lesson that we don't have time for, but uh, where might the 10 lost tribes be? What have been the efforts to find them? Which of them have had some success? That's a fascinating story too. But, those tribes essentially are lost and the Assyrians brought other peoples in to populate the district and they were the ancestors of what we call the Samaritans. Judeans and Samaritans didn't like each other. As you know, all the way down to the New Testament, there was a lot of bad blood going over many centuries. But the king of Judah survives. And the king of Judah, Hezekiah, Hezekiah is considered one of the righteous kings of Judah because in the eyes of the book of Kings, he's one of the few kings who worshiped Jehovah alone and didn't decide to buy supplemental insurance by having insurance from the Canaanite gods as well. 
God alone. Now, the Assyrian did not uh, defeat Jerusalem. There's a very interesting uh, archeological artifact. I, I gave it to you in the first day's worth of um, pictures. I think this is called the prism um, cylinder where the Assyrian emperor boasts, I destroyed this city and I destroyed that city and I destroyed that city. And as for Jerusalem, I held the king like a bird in a cage. Now, do you know the two words spin control? This is eighth century BCE spin control. If you are besieging a city militarily, is your goal to keep the defender like a bird in the cage? No, your goal is to get into the cage and plunder it, right? So for the Assyrian to boast, I held King Hezekiah like a, uh, a bird in the cage is actually not so different than the Bible's account of the same siege where Hezekiah is inside and Isaiah the prophet is urging him to hold fast. And uh, Isaiah says to him, it won't be very long now before God is going to deliver you. And um, sure enough, there's, uh, according to the Bible, an angel of the Lord spreads uh, terror and illness in the Assyrian camp and they broke camp and fled. Now, if Dr. Walter Reed had been there, he might have said it was dysentery <laughs> that made them break and flee. But as uh, the character of the prophet Nathan, uh, the, the actor was Raymond Massey, uh, Gregory Peck, David and Bathsheba. Remember Raymond Massey plays Nathan? It's a great role. He says, all causes are from God. <laughs> right? Why not natural causes too? Right? It's all part of God's toolkit. So whatever it was, the Bible and the Assyrians' own propaganda seem to agree that Judah survived. Now, here's the thought that I want to share with you. There were loyalists to the one God alone who are likely to have fled the Assyrian invasion and made it to Jerusalem where King Hezekiah would have welcomed them. They were probably from the original sanctuary at Shiloh, which had been out of power, but still a very important place. Just as College of William and Mary, Williamsburg is still a very important place today. Intellectually, it's still a center in, in our state, even though it's not the capital, right? It's a little bit off the, the beaten path, but it's still an important place to learn from. So the priests of Shiloh and the faithful monotheists, we believe that that included some refugees who show up in Jerusalem and they are welcomed. And that might be why King Hezekiah has such good press in the book of Kings because these refugees, as we will see, are among the authors of, of the book of Kings. Now, Hezekiah dies, his son, Menasha and his grandson Ammon go back to the policy of syncretism, or as I like to call it, supplemental insurance. They, it's not that they don't worship the God of Israel, but they worship the God of Israel plus the other gods. And of course, you and I are conditioned because of the Ten Commandments to say, if you're gonna worship the God of Israel plus other gods, that's not worshiping the God of Israel. I mean, can you imagine saying to your spouse, right? You may say you love me, but if you also love you know, Sally over there, then you don't love me. <laughs> Can you imagine saying that? Right. Open marriage might be an absolute contradiction on monogamy, right? So, <laughs> might be. Oh, you know, scholarly caution here, right? <laughs> I was hoping someone would get that. <laughs> so, supplemental insurance uh, might be, <laughs> in the same sense, uh, contradiction to monotheism, right? You get the idea. Now, Menashe and Ammon are syncretists. Ammon is assassinated. His son, Josiah, key person in our story today, becomes king at a young age. Now, did you ever read Mark Twain's The Prince and the Pauper? Saw the movie. Well, that's probably okay too. So the, uh, the, 
the prince is the, uh, the sickly young son of Henry VIII. Edward the fourth, was it? I think sixth, Edward the sixth, okay. So he doesn't last very long, right? And then he's replaced by Mary Tudor and then by good Queen Bess, right? Smartest woman on the throne in the 16th century. A smartest woman or man on the throne in the 16th century. Anyway, so a young king who's still a minor is likely to have a regent. If you look closely at the names and the lineages, you come up with some of the names of people from the Shiloh priesthood, like Chilkiah. It seems that Josiah was tutored by authentic monotheists. Now, we get to the really important story here. Second Kings 22 and 23. Do you know anything about um, refurbishing a church which has been around for a long time and needs a lot of work? <laughs> Have you ever had experience of that? <laughs> it's a complicated process. Do you know that when you're rooting around, you might find things that you didn't know were there? Did you know that? I'll bet you have. That would be a good cup of coffee conversation. So I, I would love to see some of the old reels that were in the projection room upstairs that someone forgot to take away. I'd love to know what we were watching when that was a projection room back then. Just by the way, maybe we were watching the silent version of the Ten Commandments. Who knows? So the book of 2 Kings chapter 22 tells us that while they're working on refurbishing Solomon's temple, which is 300 plus years old by then. I mean, it's like the Wren building at William and Mary. That's how old it is, right? Except the Wren building is reconstructed, but it's, it's how old the Wren building should have been, right? They find a scroll and they bring it to the scribe, Shaphan, who reads it to King Josiah and he tears his garments in mourning. And this is what he says, 2 Kings 22, verses eight through 12. When the king had heard the words of the book of the law, he rent his clothes. The king commanded saying, go, inquire of the Lord for me and for the people and for all of Judah concerning the words of this book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is kindled against us because our fathers have not hearkened unto the words of this book to do according unto all that which is written concerning us. I never know why all these Bible characters sound just like King James. <laughs> I mean, even in the movies, they sound British. <laughs> I don't know, I'm, I'm waiting for a Bible movie which makes Moses sound like he's from Alabama. <laughs> so the king obviously was motivated to make some religious reformation. When we look closely at what he did, it gives us a big clue as to what that scroll was. So I invite you to follow me on this little uh, mystery right now. So I'm going to skip now to chapter 23, verses 8 and 9 of 2 Kings. Among all the other things that Josiah did, he got rid of the idolatry, uh, he got rid of the um, temple prostitution. Did you know about that? Uh, you know, they were fertility gods. Maybe we shouldn't call it prostitution, right? They were fertility gods. They believed that the the, the act of, uh, of sexual intimacy is a form of worship. Maybe some people think it is, right? Maybe some people say, oh God, and they think it is. <laughs> but in any case, Josiah gets rid of all that. <laughs> but look what else he gets rid of. Look what else he gets rid of, verses eight and nine. He brought all the priests out of the cities of Judah and defiled the high places where the priests had burned incense. He broke down the high places which were at the gate of the city. The priests of those high places did not come up to the altar of the Lord in Jerusalem, but they did eat the matzah bread among their brethren. That last little phrase, that clause actually, that last little clause gives us a real clue. He is not suppressing idolatry here. If he were suppressing idolatry, he wouldn't have given a golden parachute to the priests, 
Right? He wouldn't have given them a lifetime you know, social security benefit. He's treating them as legitimate priests, but he's shutting down their parishes. That means that they are priests functioning at altars to the one God, but not the altar in Jerusalem. And he believes, as his great-grandfather Hezekiah believed, that that was wrong, and that only one place is the correct place to bring sacrifice to the one God. One God, one place. That little clue tells us what this scroll is. So now let's look at Deuteronomy chapter 12. And I'll pick up at verse 10. Moses giving instruction to the Israelites who are, take a look at the map, they are on the east side of the Jordan River. Uh, you see where it says uh, Moab on the east side of the Dead Sea? They're in the plains of Moab. Moses is giving his farewell valedictory address and he says to them, here are a set of regulations for when you cross the Jordan and come into the land which we've been traveling to for a whole generation. When you go over the Jordan and live in the land that the Lord your, give, your God is giving you to inherit, when God gives you rest from all your enemies around so you live in safety, then to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make God's name reside there, there shall you bring all that I command you. That one place. Take care that you do not offer your burnt offerings at any place that you see but only at the place that the Lord will choose in one of your tribes. There shall you bring your burnt offerings and do all that I am commanding you. Centralization of the worship. That's what Deuteronomy chapter 12 orders. No other law code. We were talking about how Deuteronomy seems like a, a reiteration of earlier law codes, which it is. That's what Deuteronomy means. Deutero to nomos law, right? Second iteration of giving the law. But Deuteronomy is not simply a verbatim copy of Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers. It has some distinctive themes. One, by the way, is education. Deuteronomy is very concerned with educating your children. Uh, another characteristic theme of Deuteronomy is uh, humane, charitable compassion. The, the widow, the orphan, the stranger who doesn't have family that that person can rely on, the Levite, that's a, that's a key thing here, I'm gonna explain it. Have your hand open for them. Don't have a closed fist, have an open hand. That's Deuteronomy. And Deuteronomy chapter 12 says, only one altar. Now what does only one altar and have compassion for the Levites have in common? Think about how many Levites just lost their jobs with the shutting down of all those other places. They just lost their livelihoods. So Deuteronomy is commanding us, be generous to them. Be that golden parachute that they need. So now, why would Hezekiah, why would Josiah, why would the priests of Shiloh want to shut down all the other altars? The answer is pretty obvious. They were doing it wrong. They were worshiping the God of Israel and the gods of Canaan. That's not the way to worship the God of Israel. So the Josiah Reformation is lauded in the book of 2 Kings extravagantly, up to the point of saying that Never again was there a king like King Josiah, never before and never since. Does that remind you of something from the end of Deuteronomy? And Moses, the servant of God, died at the word of the Lord. And God personally buried Moses. And to this day, no one knows where that grave is. But there never again rose in Israel like unto Moses as a prophet who had face-to-face -face conversations with God. Never again was there a prophet like Moses. Never again was there a king like Josiah. It's, it's the same phraseology. And it shows us in one of many ways that the 
quote-unquote e-document, which we've understood as coming from the center part of Israel and probably the priests of the Shiloh Tabernacle, is influencing the d-document, which comes to fruition in Jerusalem, but probably written by those refugees as well. And uh, we know that that happens. Refugees from uh, Nazi Germany arrived in the United States. Uh, many of them settled uh, in Southern California and continued to write what they wrote. So you can see Berlin 1920s, Los Angeles 1940s. It's half a world away, but the ideology is coherent. The Book of D is like the, uh, the Book of E in that sense. And just to, um, to give you one more little point, going back to Sharpsburg versus Antietam. Remember that? What's the name of the mountain where the Israelites get the Ten Commandments? Sinai? Depends who you ask. <laughs> if you ask the J document, it's Sinai. If you ask the E document, it's Horev, H-O-R-E-B, Horev. John Milton picks up Horev at the beginning of Paradise Lost, right, Horeb. Which of those two names does the D document like to use? Chorev, rest my case. <laughs> you see how it, we have in the seventh century, Israelites contemplating disaster. You see, history isn't only written by winners. This is the point I wanna make as a closing point for now and it will set us up for a very important lesson next week about Israel in exile and pulling it all together. History isn't only written by the winners. Sometimes it's written by the luckier among the losers who manage to escape and continue writing what becomes history. Right? Think of uh, Thomas Mann living in Southern California and writing his indictment of Nazism in Dr. Faustus, right? Think of uh, the other you know, great refugees of the, of the Nazis, uh, Theodore Adorno, the critic. Uh, think, of, uh, think of Kurt Weill, who, uh, who establishes himself in New York and becomes a, uh, a champion of anti-Nazi uh, thinking in, in America. So <clears throat> those who didn't win, but who survived to tell their point are also important for us. We believe that the Bible reflects that over and over again. Today we've seen that those lucky few who survived the massive destruction that the Assyrians perpetrated on northern Israel, they destroyed the whole kingdom. They banished all 10 of those tribes. To this day, we only have glimmers of where they are. And they replace them with different inhabitants who practice some melange of the worship of the God of Israel and the worship of the gods where they had come from, the Samaritans. So politically, the, uh, the Israelite people lost, but some of their voices were not stilled. Some of their voices remained and influenced the next generation of religious voices that emanated in this case from Jerusalem. And together that gives us three of the four major sources that when put together are the, uh, the Hebrew Testament. The, the J source, the E source, and the D source. What I'm missing, some of you may know this already, is a massive part of it which reflects the interests of priests. One more alphabet soup letter, and this one will be P for priestly. So next week, I'm gonna tell you about the work of the priests, which spans the whole time period that I've been talking about, but continues into the exile, and how they take this nascent uh, text and combine it with other texts and give us what ultimately becomes the Hebrew Bible and Finally, we're going to see how Ezra the scribe brings that Bible back to Jerusalem. So over the next two weeks, we're gonna see how the Bible reaches its um, finished form 
and then how it becomes the constitution of the Jewish people. So, yes, please. I wish I could, but it's off to the bottom left beyond the map. <laughs> it's, it's about here. <laughs> this is the Sinai Peninsula. It's about there. <laughs> okay, so Nile River, Nile Delta, okay, Nile Delta, Sinai Peninsula between the body of Egypt and the finger that becomes the Red Sea, and then you have Arabia. So the Sinai Peninsula is that peninsula between Egypt and Arabia, and Mount Sinai right in the southern part of the Sinai Peninsula. I'll give you a map for that next time. Sir. Uh, assuming that the Dead Sea was the clock, where would I make the dot for a uh, Masada? Masada, around the um, capital D of the Dead Sea, around there. Also, and right next to Masada, you'll see the, uh, the springs of Ein Gedi, where, uh, where David uh, hides out when King Saul's trying to get him. The scrolls? The, the Dead Sea scrolls are Qumran, that's further north. That's maybe near the A of dead. Yeah, that's where Qumran is, more or less. Oh, all of this on the left, all this on the Israel side. On the, on the right side, the east side, the one interesting place is called Nebo, N-E-B-O, where there is a traditional, uh, where there's a tradition of Moses being buried there, although, of course, we don't know exactly where uh, Moses is buried. We might know where Washington slept, but we don't know where Moses is buried. <laughs> <laughs>